Introduction This book was written by a personality called Seth, who speaks of himself as an energy personality essence, no longer focused in physical form. He has been speaking through me for over seven years now, in twice-weekly trance sessions. My psychic initiation really began one evening in September 1963, however, as I sat writing poetry. Suddenly, my consciousness left my body, and my mind was barraged by ideas that were astonishing and new to me at the time. When returned to my body, I discovered that my hands had produced an automatic script explaining many of the concepts that I'd been given. The notes were even titled, The Physical Universe as Idea Construction. Because of that experience, I began doing research into psychic activity and planned a book on the project. In line with this, my husband, Rob, and I experimented with a Ouija board late in 1963. After the first few sessions, the pointer spelled out messages that claimed to come from a personality called Seth. Neither Rob or I had any psychic background, and when I began to anticipate the board's replies, I took it for granted that they were coming from my subconscious. Not long after, however, I felt impelled to say the words aloud, and within a month I was speaking for Seth while in a trance state. The messages seemed to begin where idea construction left off, and later Seth said that my expansion of consciousness experience had represented his first attempt at contact. Since then, Seth has delivered a continuing manuscript that now totals over 6,000 pages typewritten. We call it the Seth Material, and it deals with such topics as the nature of physical matter, time, and reality, the God concept, probable universes, health, and reincarnation. From the beginning, the obvious quality of the material intrigued us, and it was for this reason that we continued. Following the publication of my first book in this field, letters came from strangers asking for Seth's help. We held sessions for those most in need. Many of the people involved couldn't attend since they lived in other parts of the country, yet Seth's advice helped them, and the information he gave by mail concerning individual backgrounds was correct. Rob has always taken verbatim notes of the Seth sessions using his own shorthand system. Later in the week, he types them and adds them to our collection of Seth material. Rob's excellent notes point up the living framework in which the sessions take place. His support and encouragement have been invaluable. To our way of thinking, we have kept over 600 appointments with the universe, though Rob would never describe it in that way himself. These appointments are kept in our well-lighted, large living room, but in deeper terms, they take place within the spaceless area of human personality. I do not mean to imply that we have any cornerstone on truth, or give the impression that we wait breathlessly for the undistorted secrets of the ages to gush forth. I do know that each individual has access to intuitional knowledge and can gain glimpses of inner reality. The universe speaks to each of us in this regard. In our case, the Seth sessions are the framework in which this kind of communication takes place. In the Seth material, published in 1970, I explained these events and gave Seth's view on a variety of subjects with excerpts from the sessions. I also described our encounters with psychologists and parapsychologists as we tried to understand our experiences and place them within the context of normal life. The tests we conducted to verify Seth's clairvoyant abilities were also described. As far as we are concerned, he came through with flying colors. It was extremely difficult to choose a few excerpts on any given topic from Seth's growing body of work. As a result, the Seth material necessarily left many questions unanswered and many topics unexplored. Two weeks after it was finished, however, Seth dictated the outline for this present manuscript, in which he would be free to state his ideas in his own way, in book form. Here is a copy of that outline, which was given to us in session 510, January 19, 1970. As you'll see here, Seth calls me Rupert and Rob Joseph. These names represent our entire personalities as distinguished from our present physically oriented selves. I am working on some other material just now that you will be given, and so you must bear with me for a few moments. For example, I would like to give you some idea of the contents of my own book. Many issues will be involved. The book will include a description of the way in which it is being written and the procedures necessary so that my own ideas can be spoken by Rupert, or for that matter, translated at all in vocal terms. I do not have a physical body, and yet I will be writing a book. The first chapter will explain how and why. The next chapter will describe what you may call my present environment, 
my present characteristics and my associates. By this I mean those others with whom I come in contact. The next chapter will describe my work and those dimensions of reality into which it takes me. For as I travel into your reality, I also travel into others to fulfill that purpose which is mine to fill. The next chapter will deal with my past in your terms and some of those personalities that I have been and I have known. At the same time, I will make it clear that there is no past, present, or future, and to explain that there is no contradiction, even though I may speak in terms of past existences. This may possibly run two chapters. The next chapter will give the story of our meeting, you, Rupert, and I, from my own viewpoint, of course, and the ways in which I contacted Rupert's inner awareness long before either of you knew anything about psychic phenomena or my existence. The next chapter will deal with the experience of any personality at the point of death, and with the many variations on this basic adventure. I will use some of my own deaths as examples. The next chapter will deal with existence after death, with its many variations. Both of these chapters will bear on reincarnation as it applies to death, and some emphasis will also be given to death at the end of the last incarnation. The next chapter will deal with the emotional realities of love and kinship between personalities, with what happens to these during succeeding incarnations, for some fall by the wayside and some are retained. The next chapter will deal with your physical reality as it appears to me and others like me. This chapter will contain some rather fascinating points, for not only do you form the physical reality that you know, but you are also forming other quite valid environments in other realities by your present thoughts, desires, and emotions. The next chapter will deal with the eternal validity of dreams as gateways into these other realities, and as open areas through which the inner self glimpses the many facets of his experience and communicates with other levels of its reality. The next chapter will deal further with the subject as I relate the various ways that I have entered the dreams of others, both as an instructor and as a guide. The next chapter will deal with the basic methods of communication that are used by any consciousness, according to its degree whether or not it is physical. This will lead up to the basic communication used by human personalities as you understand them, and point out these inner communications as existing independently of the physical senses, which are merely physical extensions of inner perceptions. I will tell the reader how he sees what he sees or hears what he hears, and why I hope to show through the entire book that the reader himself is independent of his physical image, and I hope, myself, to give him some methods that will prove my thesis to him. The next chapter will relate what experience I have had in all of my existences with those pyramid gestalts of which I speak in the material, and about my own relationship with the personality you call Seth, too, and with multidimensional consciousnesses far more evolved than I. My message to the reader will be, basically, you are no more of a physical personality than I am, and in telling you of my reality, I tell you of your own. There will be a chapter on the religions of the world, on the distortions and truths within them, the three Christs, and some data concerning a lost religion, belonging to a people of which you have no information. These people lived on a planet in the same space that your Earth now occupies, before your planet existed. They destroyed it through their own error, and were reincarnated when your planet was prepared. Their memories became the basis for the birth of religion as you know think of it. There will be a chapter on probable gods and probable systems. There will be a question and answer chapter. There will be a final chapter in which I will ask the reader to close his eyes and become aware of the reality in which I exist, and of his own inner reality. I will give the methods. In this chapter, I will invite the reader to use his inner senses to see me in his own way. All my communications will come exclusively through Berbert at all times to protect the integrity of the material, I will invite the reader to become aware of me as a personality, so that he may then realize that communications from other realities is possible, and that he himself is therefore open to perception that is not physical. Now this is my outline for the book, but it contains merely a sketch of my intentions. I am not giving a fuller outline, for I do not want Rupert to anticipate me. The difficulties involved in such communications will be given thoroughly. It will be made clear that so-called paranormal communications come from various levels of reality, and that those communications describe the reality in which they exist. So I will describe mine and others of which I have knowledge. 
This is not to say that other dimensions do not exist of which I am ignorant. I will dictate the book during our own sessions. This is the title for our book, Seth Speaks, The Eternal Validity of the Soul. I am using the term soul for it will have instant meaning to most readers. I suggest you equip yourself with good pens. Precisely because I am acquainted with the effort involved in writing a book, I was cautious when Seth spoke of writing his own. Though I knew perfectly well that he could do it, a nagging part of me questioned. Granted, the Seth material is really significant, but what does Seth know about writing books? About the organization required? Or about directing himself to the public? Rob kept telling me not to worry about it. Friends and students seemed astonished that of all people I should have any doubts, but I thought, of all people, who else should have doubts? Here was a stated intent. Could Seth follow through? Seth began dictating the book in our next session, 511, January 21st, 1970, and finished it in session 591, August 11th, 1971. The intervening sessions did not all involve book dictation. However, some were devoted to personal matters, some given for specific people who needed help, and some were in answer to philosophical questions not connected with the book. I also took several little vacations. Despite such layoffs, Seth always picked right up precisely where he left off dictation. During the time that he was working on his book, I was writing four hours a day on a book of my own, conducting my weekly ESP class, and finding myself swamped by the correspondence that followed publication of the Seth material. I also began holding a weekly class in creative writing. Out of curiosity, I took over a few of the early chapters of Seth's book and stayed away from it. Occasionally, Rob told me about a few passages that he thought my students might be particularly interested in. Otherwise, I paid no attention to the book, being content to let Seth do it. Generally speaking, I put his work out of my mind and didn't even see the manuscript for months at a time. Reading the finished book was a delightful experience. As a whole, it was completely new to me, though each word had been spoken through my lips and I had devoted many evenings in trance to its production. This was particularly strange to me, since I am a writer myself, used to organizing my own material, keeping track of it, and hovering over it like a mother hen. Because of my own writing experience, I'm also well aware of the process involved in translating unconscious material into conscious reality. It's particularly obvious when I'm working on poetry. Whatever else is involved in Seth's book, certainly some kind of unconscious activity is operating at high gear. It was only natural, then, that I found myself comparing my own conscious creative experience with the trance procedure involved in Seth's book. I wanted to discover why I felt that Seth's book was his as divorced from mine. If both were coming from the same unconscious, then why the subjective difference in my feelings? These differences were obvious from the first. When I'm caught up in inspiration, writing a poem, then I'm turned on, excited, filled with a sense of urgency and discovery. Just before this happens, however, an idea comes out of nowhere, it seems. It is given. It simply appears, and from it new creative connections spring. I am alert, yet open and receptive, suspended in a strange psychic elasticity between poised attention and passivity. The particular poem or idea is the only thing in the world for me at that point. The highly personal involvement, the work and play involved in helping the idea out, all make the poem mine. This kind of experience has been familiar to me since early childhood. It is the cornerstone of my existence. Without it, or when I am not working generally within that framework, I become listless and sad. To some degree, I have that same sense of personal creativity now as I write this introduction. It is mine. I was not connected in this way with Seth's book and had no awareness of the creative processes involved. I went into trance as I do for our regular sessions, Seth dictated the book through me, speaking through my lips. The creative work was so distant from me that in this respect I could not call the product my own. I am, instead, given a complete product in Seth's book, an excellent one, for which I am, of course, exceedingly grateful. I found that only my own writings give me that particular kind of creative satisfaction that I need, however. The conscious involvement with unconscious material. The excitement of the chase. 